Hello, and welcome to Am I Grieving Right? My name is Dr. Liesl Dawson, and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Bristol, specialising in literature and the history of the emotions. Grief is a highly individual process. It varies in its emotions, bodily impacts, and timeline from one person to the next. And yet, these very differences can lead us to question our own experience of grief or cause us to be distrustful or critical of the grief of others. But is there a right way to grieve? Are there behaviours and activities that either should be avoided or encouraged when we are grieving? And if grief is individual, how then do we recognise when it tips into its more dangerous form, complicated grief? With me today are three experts in the field of grief to answer these questions and more. Julia Samuel is one of the UK's leading psychotherapists. She has an MBE for her work for bereaved children and she's the founder and patron of Child Bereavement UK. She's also written two best-selling books, Grief Works and This Too Shall Pass. Andy Langford is Clinical Director of Cruz Bereavement Care. He's worked for 17 years in bereavement and he's a qualified cognitive behavioural therapist, integrative counsellor and life coach. Shelby Forsythia, joining us all the way from the States, thank you, is the author of Your Grief, Your Way and Permission to Grieve. She is also the host of the podcast, Coming Back, Conversations on Life After Loss, where she helps grieving people to regain a sense of power and a sense of peace. So welcome to our presenters and speakers. Um, I'd like to start first uh, with this session by asking a question to Andy. Andy, could you talk us through, could you tell us what some of the common myths and misperceptions are about grief. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thanks so much for um, having me on this session. It's a, it's a, it's a real honour to be here um, and, and welcome everyone. Um, so, so there are a few um, sort of common myths we find voiced at Cruise Bereavement Care um, by clients, by other organisations. It's not working. Could somebody get my pack to work? Get the um, I'm on. <laughs> But, but I think I think one of the one of the main ones that sort of comes through um, from clients often contacting the helpline is 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 questions around am I normal and am I mad? So this this sort of work. concept that that um, that in some way life will be life was was normal and was was at a point, but now um, I'm completely catapulted into something that's completely di um, disorientating. And almost in a different reality, and that and that that I'm completely immersed and overwhelmed by it, and and that's entirely understandable, and and at the same time, what we find is that is that whilst it's important to recognise that, when generally most people aren't in that all the time, things move over over not just time but over a number of, of things that are factors that are coming into play there, so there can be that element. But the other one that twins with it is is this concept of um, of I'll get over it, I'll get through it. That if I if I go through certain stages and emotions, then it will be okay, and I'll emerge out the other side. And that really sort of brings up the question, really, of what what, what does that mean? What is okay? And and certainly for what we find is that is that grief isn't about going through a linear track. A process that then you emerge out the other end in some way shined up and better um, and don't get me wrong there are certainly things we can we can do to be enriched through the, the experiences we have but grief, grief we find isn't a linear process um, and the other the other one I just introduced and by any means these these three aren't, aren't the only ones just what we commonly find is is this this uh, the idea that I need to as a helper say the right thing and and i would want to speak into this because we often find this can be something that can 
can stop people helping. You know, the concept that I need to say the right thing, I need to do the right thing. Certainly when I've, I've experienced bereavement, I haven't felt like there's a right thing to say. There's not something that you will say that will make me feel better. But what I am needing as a bereaved person is connection just quiet. Yeah. and the opportunity to connect with someone and for, for, for not to not to feel isolated and alone. I might want to be with you sometimes, I might not. But the concept of having to say something right is 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 not you know it's not it's not it's not there really. You don't necessarily need a right thing to say. It's communicating that you're there for someone, which is, is so important. But sadly, what we find at Cruise is often that 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 myth can mean that people um, don't end up end up engaging with folk and sort of back away, and there can be stigma attached uh, to grief. But but often it's really about trying to connect with people and just even if you don't know what to say, at least then um, communicate that you're there for them. Add we can't hear back. you, Lisa. Oh, there we are. You can't hear me. Oh, dear. I can now. I can now. I can now. Okay, good. Um, I just wondered if either Julia or Shelby, if you wanted to add anything to that. I mean, one, I mean, Andy's answered it incredibly well. I think the thing, the other myth is, which links into it, is that nowadays people think they should be as automated um, as a fast track app. Like they should have their grief on a fast track app. If, if I do these five things or I go through the five Kubler-Ross stages, then I'm going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And that grief takes much longer than anybody wants and in some ways is a lifelong adaptation process. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's allowing the time that makes a difference. I think the other, the other thing is that um, only the person that's grieving can measure the loss. So I think we all make assumptions about how long someone's allowed to grieve or how much they should be feeling. And, you know, grief is the internal meaning of the loss. Mourning is the external expression of it. And the level of the loss is the emotional investment, the amount of love invested in the person that's died. And so only really they can know what that is. And as Andy said, those who are wanting to fix it, the best thing they can do is be with them and listen. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I think that um, grief is very much a demand that we stop living in a binary, right, wrong, bad, good, healed, not healed. And so grief asks us, okay, what feels better versus what feels worse? What feels like more healing? What feels like less healing? But it's it turns the black and white categories very much into a more of a spectrum emotionally. Thank you. Um, Julia, can I ask you, although grief is very individual and subjective, are there any basic differences that one can see between the way in which men and women grieve and children and adults grieve? I think to key very much into what Shelby was saying of, of not this binary view, I think the best model of grieving that shows differences between men and women and adults and children is the dual process, Strobe and Shoot. And what they talk about is at the moment of the loss, whatever that loss is, and it could be a living loss like losing your job or the death of someone that you love, we have two instinctive responses, loss orientation to emote and grieve and feel the pain of loss and restoration orientation to be okay, to survive, to move on and kind of invest in life. And that we oscillate between the two and doing one allows you to do the other by giving yourself opportunities to grieve, frees you to have time to be restorative, to go for a walk, to have a break from grief. Men tend to be restorative. Men tend to want to go for a plan, to go for hope, to fix things. Women tend to be loss oriented. They want to look in their memory box. They want to emote and grieve. They have a kind of Sherlock Holmes need to know every single piece of the puzzle that's missing. And they can look at their partner and think he's a selfish you know what, for not showing what he feels. And he can think that she's a wet rag for doing nothing but crying and refusing to kind of look to the future of life. And it's a seesaw. So when I work with couples, I suggest they um, give each other, help each other with the other so that he can help her have be restorative and have hope for the future. And she can give him opportunities to grieve. 
And children, we try and protect them from pain. We try and say, there, there, you're going to be okay. Children are amazing. They bounce back. But actually, children grieve as much as we do. And firstly, it's modeled by what they observe in their parents so that we shouldn't protect our children from what we're feeling. But children very much do the loss and restoration. But with the metaphor is jumping in and out of puddles. So children can be incredibly sad and really cry that their grandmother has died. And then two minutes later, they can hop out of the puddle, fight with their brother, steal his ice cream, roar with laughter, skip and get on with his day. And then something else will upset him and he'll be back in the puddle. And our job as the adults around them is to not say, no, 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 don't feel it, is to support them in it. Let them feel it, support them, listen to them, but don't try and they're there them out of it. Thank you. Shelby, can I ask you, are there any behaviours or activities that you think should be avoided or encouraged when we're grieving? I love this question because um, the temptation is to turn it into a BuzzFeed article where it's like five things to definitely do and five things to not definitely do, <laughs> to not definitely do um, when you're grieving. And I think in, in so much of my work with clients, the question I ask them is what would make you feel more free to grieve? or what would make you feel like you have more permission to grieve. And I know from personal experience after the sudden loss of my mom as a 21 year old, all I wanted to do was scream. But I was convinced as Andy was talking about earlier that that would make me a crazy person. I would have gone mad. I was going off the deep end somehow. No one would have wanted to be around me. I would be arrested, committed, spiraling into the very worst possibilities that could have happened. And when it finally happened about two and a half years later, I finally let right. myself take the lid off the experience of that. It was so free and it only lasted a half hour. Like the, the spiral that I went into of what I thought would happen versus what actually came forward um, in my grief was, was amazing to me. And so when I work with grieving people, it's not so much, again, an issue of the binary, what's a right thing to do and a wrong thing to do. It's what makes you feel more free or like you have more permission to have this experience and what makes you feel less. Oftentimes uh, what makes you feel less permission to grieve is anything involving the word should. And so I should have it more together. I should be able to meet my work deadlines. I should be able to show up for my kids and my partner in the exact same way that I did before my loss. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, for those uh, people who are watching live and even later, how can you incorporate the word allow instead? Like, what if I allowed myself 10 minutes to rest? Or what if I allowed myself to not be as productive after loss? And these, these questions invite, okay, what if I allowed this loss to actually change me and therefore allowed me to grieve it in some larger way? Thank you. Um, Julia or Andy, do you want to come in? I know, Julia, in your book, Grief Works, you have the eight pillars of strength. So you also have a, a certain set of activities or things to focus on when one's grieving. I wonder if you want to mention any of those. I think one of the, I mean, I love the way Shelby described that. And it is about allowing and what supports you in it. I think with my um, pillars of strength, what it is, is ways of being and attitudes and practices that help stabilize you when you feel like your whole life has gone completely off kilter. So, and that involves your relationship with yourself. So being self-compassionate, one of the cruel twists of grief is that you mentioned at the beginning is that people turn on themselves and have what I call a shitty committee where they start saying, I'm not doing it right. I'm an idiot. I'm a fool. And so to be the key kind of touchstone that will launch everything else to support them is being self-compassionate, being kind to themselves. It's their relationship with others. Um, it's allowing themselves to have time to be with that person that's died, that the relationship continues, touchstones to memory, but also time to have hope and think about new things. Um, I'm not going to go into them because it's going to take too much time, but people can find them on my website. No, it's true. Um, but if I, if I can risk just one quote from you that I really like, which is about that it's often not grief, but the things done to avoid grief, which cause the damage. So perhaps the things that need to be avoided are the kind of numbing activities like drinking or, you know, it, it's the avoidance of grief rather than kind of allowing grief, giving permission to grieve, if you will. Yeah, um, no, blocking the pain does you more harm than yeah. allowing yourself to grieve. Exactly. It took Shelby two and a half years and then it only took half now. <laughs> um, and it, 
and it's um it's it's a it's a it's a thing we can talk about sort of now on a webinar but actually experiencing it and going through that process is but is is no easy thing is it and actually at the time when you're going back and thinking about it it's um it's it's you know if you were putting yourself there it's understandable why you would block it in some respects it's mm. it's, it's being there in the moment so, you know um and one of the things that that we would often talk about with crews is the importance of sharing stories and sharing stories together. So when Shelby talked about her need to scream, that took me right back to when I lost my nan, when my nan died. Now, my nan was incredibly close to me. I had a similar need. And that, and that, that screaming took me about an hour and a half. Okay, and, but that, and, and, and similar sort of experience to what Shelby described there and what she said. And, and actually, there's, there's something around the sharing of stories and people connecting, which which makes a, a, a massive difference as opposed to shutting oneself away. And, and I think there's something about, about allowing vulnerability of myself and of other people, which is important. Um, but just the final thing to add on that is I, you know, what we're really interested in looking at as well um, is, is certainly how how grief is then expressed and how it's how it's most helpfully expressed in different cultures because we find that there's that there's difference in different cultures and in and and where where someone might um express their grief in, in a very expressive manner it might be seen by another culture to be to be unsound which is interesting you see so i think i think there's actually a lot of learning that we can gain and and there's there's certainly i think be more room for for research and investigation and collaboration on this is actually how do we grieve as a bunch of cultures rubbing up against each other? Thank you, that's great. Um, Andy, if I can stick with you, could you talk us through how can you tell when someone's grief has tipped into something more dangerous, like complicated grief? What are the signs? What should one be looking for in oneself or in others? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I'd take just a very brief step back from that first okay. and sort of say first off, um, you know, if you're, if you're listening to this, if you're watching this and, and you want support and you need support, please do connect with it. There's no stigma in that. So there's no weakness in that. Um, you don't have to reach a critical point before thinking, oh, actually, I better speak with someone, whether it's a close friend, family member, organisation, that actually there's you know, there's a lot of people that would say there's value in making in making that initial call and having that initial conversation. I don't need to to feel mad, to feel like I'm on the brink yeah. before I connect. You know, we don't have to wait for that. That said, um, there's, there's evidentially a, uh, some points when we, we can get to when actually grief becomes more complex to us um, and it can have a longer term impact. And some of those indicators of things like when um, we experience quite a low mood for a longer period of time that's more difficult to hold with what with whatever else we're doing in life um, there can be increased anxiety with that too and they can go hand in hand um, for some people it's not unusual to experience thoughts of death that might then bridge on to thoughts around suicide or self-harm um, and if if you've had those before, before the experience of bereavement, they may well come back. They're more likely to evidentially. Um, it's not to say that then you're at immediate risk, but those thoughts may be more present. Um, but also there's, there's, there's more likelihood that you might re-experience some of the sensory um, input that you had around the time of the bereavement. You know, we, we, we talk sometimes about post-traumatic stress. The, the seeing of the bereaved person, the person that died, sorry, um, or the, the, the smelling of them, the, the sort of sense of them near us. Um, that's not to say that if you've experienced that, you're, you, you've got a real worry. I mean, there's, 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 there's lots of people who experience that on a daily basis, and that's part of their grieving. Um, but what this can all culminate in is that the way in which you're, that, that your life as it currently stands then becomes really hard to manage and hard to do alongside the grief and that's where within crews we often see that that sort of difference is where folk will phone us or come to see us when we can meet face to face that is um, and say i'm finding it really difficult to cope 
and I've found it difficult to cope for a long time. And so it's often the coping and the difficulty with coping with job, coping with looking after family and children, um, socially connecting with people, finding meaning in life, in the, not just in the short term, but in the longer term. These are the things that often come up that are a message to us that, that it might be becoming increasingly complex for the person. Thanks. Great. Anything Shelby or Julia wants to add to that? It's seven to 10% is complex grief, the research shows, and it tends to be more women than men. Mm -hmm. um, Julia, could you talk a little bit about COVID? I'm wondering how COVID has impacted people who are grieving and also how it's impacted the ability for friends and family to support those who are grieving. I think it's dramatically um, interrupted people's capacity to grieve where always when you're grieving, the kind of first part of the shock, the surrealness um, feels, you know, very, um, people kind of feel like they're observing themselves. But the predictor of outcomes for anyone who is grieving is the love and connection to others. And the task of grieving is to face the reality of the loss. So those two things alone are completely interrupted and stopped really by COVID. So many people have neither been by the bedside or the graveside of the person they died that died. So they may have seen their 50 year husband or wife die on, a, on an iPad while they were at home alone because no one else could be with them. And so the shock of that, the level of that loss without their friends and their family supporting them and holding them and not having a memory of holding their hand, not having the opportunity to say goodbye, um, not having a proper funeral where everyone comes together and both grieves the loss but celebrates the life and feels the connection to each other. That is a huge space where people then are completely kind of disoriented. They don't have the proper memories. And so I think the level of complex grief is going to be much higher. Um, many of the people that I've been seeing feel that it, they, they've just been watching a video. It isn't real. Um, and so, I mean, it's very worrying and it's not, it's nobody's fault. But, you know, all the what ifs of grief derail the grieving process as well. And for anyone who's had that experience, there will be hundreds of what ifs. Um, so it is, it's a, it's a very um, difficult picture I think we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Is that what you found as well, Andy and Shelby? Yeah, I think um, in speaking to COVID-19 specifically, it's a very harsh and cruel reminder that we live in a world where anything can happen. And where in other times in our lives we've kind of known, you know, the memorial can be held on this day. I'm kind of, I have to go back to work on this day. Uh, I can honor milestones in a year or in two years or in five years or in 10 years on these days continually. There's a lot more ambiguity about how that's going to look and what's going to happen next. And there's also this really simultaneously, this really cruel reality that grief support for so many people right now is existing only online. Mm -hmm. And that because you cannot sit face to face with somebody because you cannot be held by them. Um, the words I'm hearing in my head is like, it will never be quite enough. It's never gonna be quite exactly what you need. And so I think people who are grieving with COVID-19 right now are having to do the very heavy work of not only balancing their own grief, but knowing that what support they reach for while it will be good, while it will be helpful, while it be community building in some aspect, it's not quite the grief support that they really, really want. Um, and need right now. And there is another kind of grief in that. So not only am I grieving a loss due to COVID, but I'm grieving the fact that I can't get the grief support that I really need because of COVID um, still. And so it's this allowing there to be multi-layered losses in this experience. And grief is embodied. And one of the things that holds us steady when we feel completely not ourselves is the touch and the holding of someone else, but not the words. And that's in a way what you're talking about, this absence of presence, this bodilessness. So there's the person that's died that is missing. And then there's the other people in your life who can hold you, who don't have to say anything, but can 
put their arm around your shoulder, give you a hug, hold your hand. That can speak volumes and support and love and what people physiologically need to help stabilize them. Yeah, absolutely. And also also trauma is embodied, isn't it? It's a very mm -hmm. physical, physical thing that we can experience. If it is, we're more likely to experience that if we're bereaved in the context of COVID. And, and you know, I, I would certainly say what you know what we're finding more and more is actually that yes, we're working with people um in those multi-layered ways that Shelby was talking about there, um, who have been bereaved through COVID nineteen. We're working with people who've been bereaved uh, in in the context of the pandemic by by another um, by another means, um, and often those bereavements are more sudden by COVID or otherwise. Um, if it's a, if it's if COVID, for instance, complicated existing disorder, but but the other or condition, sorry, but the other the other group of people I think which we can often miss in services is actually those that, that are coming to us having experienced a bereavement months or years ago, well before this was even imagined would happen. Um, and then their grief comes back in full of force now because of the context that we exist in. Um, and we find that we find that more and more. It's interesting to see that you know some of our statistics that we that we're noting would state that that more people are presenting to to crews um, now than before. Uh, having been bereaved by other means, but um, whilst a proportion of those people are, are, are having bereaved, been bereaved recently, there's numbers still that have been bereaved six months, nine months, several years ago, well before COVID. Mm -hmm. um, this context of bereavement um, and grief and loss, it, it, it brings forward that, those mm -hmm. emotions again, doesn't it? Or, or I say again, perhaps they've not been experienced before, but actually the context then provides that space. Um, Shelby, can I ask you, uh, what can we do to support grieving people? We've heard a, a few things already, but I wonder if you have other insights. And what is it that holds us back sometimes from supporting grieving people? Yeah, this is a multi-layered question. Um, because I, I feel probably like everyone here, I've sat on both sides of the fence. I've been the bereaved person, but I've also tried to be a comforting shoulder arm person on the other side of a text message who's trying to comfort somebody who's bereaved. Um, and it's tricky because like the title of the seminar, there's a pressure to say the right thing, do the right thing, and to have an outcome of feel better. Um, and it's, it's so tricky. I think one of the, re the things that we can do to support grieving people is to ask questions like, if you could tell me anything about your loss right now, what would that be? or tell me a way that you would like to be supported right now, what would that be? Because I think grieving people so often, myself included, we want to teach other people how to help us grieve. And we feel sometimes that we must because the westernized world doesn't really do it for us. Um, it doesn't teach our friends and family how to best support grieving people. And so often I'm like, well, crap, I've got to teach the people around me what I actually want and need right now, as opposed to she's in a better place. She's with God now. Don't worry. She didn't suffer. I'm like, none of this is helpful to me. Here's what I wish you would say. And so permission to allow me to hand you those tools or those words or those phrases. Um, but also a permission, I think, to not, to not know what I want. And so to be asked, you know, would it feel good right now to receive a hug? Would it be okay if I brought dinner over on Friday and just left it on the porch? Cause I know we're socially distancing right now. Or um, would it be okay if I kind of step back now, but check in with you in six months when everybody else disappears? Is that okay if that's something that I do for you? And allowing grieving people to respond like yes or no, that feels, again, not spectrum of right or wrong, but spectrum of better or worse. So it gives you a little more um, breathing room there. And one of my favorite things, I'm actually um, working on a third book right now about three tiny phrases we can use to comfort grieving people. And I'll share the first one, and that's of course. Whatever you're going through, whatever thoughts are racing through your head, whatever you want or feel compelled to do in the aftermath of loss, you're not crazy for wanting it or thinking it or wishing it were real. Of course, that would be real for you. Um, and so when Andy was speaking to this desire to scream or I have this own desire to scream in the aftermath of my mother's death, I'm like, I'm going to go crazy. Nobody's going to want to be around me. I'm going to get arrested. But I want to scream. And for somebody to come up and say, of course, that makes total sense that you just want to shriek because your mom is dead. Like that would have given me so much, I'm like shoulders relaxing, chest opening, 
permission, freedom to be able to experience that. And so when you're speaking to somebody who's grieving, you can, you can see them winding themselves into the stratosphere of why they shouldn't be feeling a certain way or they start putting themselves in that little box. Sometimes the most freeing thing you can hear is, of course, or that makes total sense to me why you would feel that way. So, yeah, you don't so have to understand. So listening and validating, <laughs> yes, I'm getting from yes. you. They need to be listened to, they need to be heard, and, you know, their needs validated and maybe even encouraged to take that step of whatever that impulse is. Um, yes, and it's different from I understand how you feel, which can yeah. feel insulting to grieving people or like, how could you possibly because you haven't lost a parent or a child or a spouse or whoever we're losing, but it's, it's a human recognition of, I see how you got there. Yeah. Yeah, that's really important. I, I find that really challenging me because it's particularly those situations when if someone was to say to me, I, I understand how you feel, then well, that's a bit of a surprise. I don't understand how I feel myself, you know, um, in that situation, I haven't got a clue. And I think the, it's it is, as you say, Shelby, it's important to give space for that because I think what, what can arise if that doesn't happen is shame and guilt and repressed anger and it gets pushed into our bodies and it comes back six months later as chronic migraines and back pain and stomach ulceration and things like that. So it is important to give that sort of contained space, really, to the prospect that, that I might have to grieve a particular way is um is caustic to us um but i think certainly you know at cruise and i know we you know we've got a lot of learning to do around this no doubt but um you know it, it's we're finding it increasingly interesting and important to think about well how do we look at this when we when we when once again like i said before there are so many cultures that that have um societal norms over how to grieve and rituals to grieve that are so vastly important and need credibility and, and need understanding. And also there's this difference between those. And, and there's, I think there's something around um, how creating space that if you're the person who is, ex who, is, who is going to support the person who's bereaved, actually how do you give space to, to try and understand this, not, not just this individual is different from me, but where they come from, their heritage, their context, their culture, their race, their gender, their, their sexuality, their everything. They're, all of these factors can come into play with difference and also this commonality in that we are both human beings. Um, and, and, and holding the commonality and difference, I think, together is important. And presumably the reason that people are held back a lot of the time is because they're just nervous of saying the right thing, you know, that they're kind of frightened and that really they just need to be encouraged to check in, to ask how someone's doing and just to be given that opportunity to, to, to talk about it and not to forget about them when the initial grieving phase is over, but to kind of keep checking in and to keep, you know, be willing to say the dead person's name and think about them but perhaps to take the lead of the griever. Um, that's helpful. Um, I'm quite curious about the view of social media. I, I'm sure you've all noticed that social media has become um, much more common as a space to express grief. Sometimes people are critical of this. Um, Andy, I know you've, you've thought about this before. What, what are your views about grief being expressed on social media? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, it's an evolving thing, isn't it? And, and, and rightly so. I'm sure if you were to ask me again in three months' time, I'll have a different view um, because it, it's, it's changing all the time. And when we understand what we talk about with social media, different channels emerge um, and they have different flavours to them. What we're, what we're finding at Cruise is that it's different channels of social, social media are, are providing space for people to speak out about how they feel and what their thoughts are, and create a space for um, those thoughts to become words that are then communicated to others with a view that there are others out there who will have some commonality with them and be able to list, to, to read them and have an understanding. And, and that, what's communicated to us, is that's really precious to people. And I think alongside that, what's important as well is safety. 
mm. and the and the the understanding that in order to create that, I mean, having having sort of worked as a therapist for years, is that that concept of creating that safe space is sort of drilled into you, isn't it? You know, but that the idea that actually that needs to be a safe space, there needs to be safe space on social media too, and and where I think that the the another aspect that comes into play with that is is um is the web can be very disinhibiting can't it so you know we might see people um talking vociferously about what they really really believe in we might see people um um communicating their emotions in a way they wouldn't feel comfortable to face to face or even over the phone but actually one of the things that, that i think is going to be important increasingly important for people as we go um month, uh, month by month and year by year is actually an understanding of what does that mean for me so what am I comfortable in sharing consciously, knowing that this this medium can be disinhibiting, that I'm, I might be, may be more likely to share something over social media, in print, but also knowing that once I have shared something, and I'm not meaning to be, to sort of say this in a sort of scary way, but once I have shared something, it's then out there. And, and I think that, that having that understanding is really important because if you're anything like me, when you're in, when, when you when you're aroused to a high level emotionally, it's harder to think. It's harder to think in a logical manner, and so so being aware of that, it, it could be quite disinhibiting that arena, or those arenas, but also that it's it's in doing so when you've communicated something, you lose control of it. Other people have that then, and so it's as long as you're comfortable with the messaging you're sharing. That's okay, but you need to be aware of those things as well. Yeah, that makes sense. So almost as if social media can be really comforting and helpful, but also there is something about grief that can lift inhibitions, um, just like you know early stages, and maybe just to be a bit careful about where one does things and the kind of long-term impacts. Um, I think that makes sense. Mm. Well, absolutely. I think the other thing, just to add, if I may, is that is that. When we uh, we see people talk about grief on social media, the, the the deaths that they're touched by, it may well be, you know, I've certainly made the assumption of thinking, well, actually, how are you connected with this person you're then identifying with and are grieving about? Yeah. But actually, people are connecting in different ways on social media. You know, we 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 see the lives of those that are on social media or celebrities, and we identify with them, mm. and we think there's a commonality. We follow them. And we connect with them in a different way. Yeah. And then when they die, we experience something. We experience grief. And it's going to be different from if my mom or my dad died, but it's 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 grief nonetheless. Mm. And and there's there's that experience I think which is is needing to be recognised, which perhaps we haven't we haven't seen before because these channels are, are, are very comparatively recent. Mm. Thank you. People often talk about how grief changes them, you know, how they come out of the experience different people. And we, we know about all the difficult things about grief, all the hard things, um, how, they how it challenges us. But is there anything positive we can say about having gone through a grief, a period of grieving? Um, Julia, uh, could you start with this, please? I mean, I think that there is and there can be I think it starts with the paradox of grief, which I talk about in my book, is that it's by allowing yourselves to feel the pain, getting support in the pain, that then allows you to accommodate and um, face the reality of what you never wanted to happen. So through that adaptation process, you do become a different person, both in relation to the person that's died, but also in relation to who you are, what you believe in, what you mind about your perception of life. And there's been quite a lot of research looking at post-traumatic growth, which never de denies the level of the loss or the pain, but are people who have found that they have grown through very traumatic, complex losses have found things like their perception of what matters, that it's people that matter to them changes their perception that they are much stronger and more resilient and robust than they ever imagined, that now that they survived this death, they feel able to face many more storms in life. But also the storms that they minded about in the past don't even look like storms, they look like puddles now. So that um, 
their whole they feel it never stops them feeling pain at times but they feel kind of more robust because they've survived something that they thought would would shrink them and break them and, and they haven't been broken at all they've expanded in fact that's lovely um shelby i also know that you talk about grief growers on your podcast and you, uh, one of your lines is even in grief, we are growing. And so I wonder if you want to share some of your thoughts about this as well. I'm gonna piggyback right on Julia's commentary on expansion because I think that's exactly what's happening in grief. I have um, this image sometimes of the great timeline of our lives, we're born and then we die. But as between that time, we are constantly expanding what it means to be human, both the wisdom that we accumulate from outside sources, but also what we learn to know about ourselves and the depth of emotion we can feel and the breadth of the relationships that we can have. And so as we are progressing along in life, we're also learning more about what it means to just be alive. And I think so many grieving people, myself included, make a mistake when they come into life after loss because their goal is, I need to be better from this, I need to grow from this, I need to learn from this, which just turns the whole grief experience into a homework assignment. And that's a lot of pressure. And it, again, we're talking about breaking out of these black and white boxes. Grief is not a pass or fail experience. And so when I use this tagline of because even through grief, we are growing already, even if you are not trying to grow through grief, there is growth happening because each additional day that you're living life after loss, it's it's a different day. Even if in COVID-19, you're repeating the same tasks and the same things over and over, you will never think the same day twice. You will never feel the same day twice. And so to look back a week ago, a month ago, six months ago, and say, wow, I have accumulated this much information. It may not feel good. It may be information learned through pain, but you are learning more about yourself and what you can tolerate and what you can um, survive and also Hmm. the things in yourself that you can learn to have more faith in and more trust in in the future. Something I speak about with clients, I'm like, look over, over the course of your life, the past 10 years, 20 years, even 30 years prior to this, have you always had food on the table? Have you always had a roof over your head, even in the tumult of everything you have lived in your life? And there's this wild, um, beautiful reassurance that comes of like, wow, the one consistency has been me. I'm the common denominator in this experience. Somehow I've managed to not only survive, but caretake for myself, and sometimes in larger ways, caretake for others like children or parents. Um, and and it's really beautiful. Growth is already happening. You do not have to force it into existence. That's lovely. Andy, do you want to add anything or pick anything up from that? I think often growth comes through adversity, doesn't it? Uh, I always want to say that lightly. Um, but growth often comes through through, through difficulty. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing I'd, I'd just sort of practically say, you know, at, at, at Cruise, we've got, we've got lots of people who volunteer for us, right? They provide, I mean, I, I just take this opportunity to flagrantly say, I think they're wonderful. They give their time and energy in Cruise, other organizations, people volunteer to, to, to reach out to Brifo. And I think that's wonderful. And many of those people who are volunteering are doing that partly or fully because they've been bereaved themselves because they felt some pain that, that is then that thought amongst other things, I want to do something for someone else. You know, I, I think that's profound. It moves me, it brings tears to my eyes now, you know, that, that actually if we felt pain, we can be moved to then help someone else. Yeah. And that helps me a bit too. If you can, if, I mean, to be blunt, if you're kind to someone, it helps you, doesn't it? You know, and, and I think that on a very basic human level, it, 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 it won't heal everything, but it it's around connection again, and it, it does it does it does make it does make it, does, it makes me feel good if I've helped someone, you know. So so I think there's a lot to be said said for that. Actually, I might be experiencing some pain myself, but also it moves me to do something, yeah. which is important as well. So it kind of increases resilience and compassion, and changes the way we see ourselves in the world, and kind of expands the world that we see really. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just about out of time. Um, I wonder if there's any final thoughts. I think I've, I've learned a huge amount today and I hope our listeners have gotten a better sense of um, the kind of variety and individuality of grief. 
um, but also the fact that it can lead to growth, which I think is a very positive thing. Um, does anyone have any final thoughts about Am I Grieving Right? It's a bit of a sidebar, but often there's time for questions and we haven't had time for questions. So if someone wants to ask me a question, they can follow me on Instagram and, and I'm very happy to continue the conversation. Yes, and I, and I should also say, yes, so please do get in touch. Sorry, we haven't had time for questions. But also, if you want to know more, um, I would highly recommend um, the lovely books, the wonderful books of our speakers, Julia Samuels' um, Grief Works, which has lots of really helpful information and advice. And I think, although your second book isn't so squarely on grief, I think it does relate to it in terms of change. And Shelby, your, your opening with the 10 truths about grief in Permission to Grieve. I think that's actually a very good list for debunking um, a lot of the, the myths about grief. And Your Grief Your Way has lovely little individual moments for grievers that can turn to a kind of daily bit of reading and quotation and thought, um, and also to go to cruise. So yes, please, uh, we can't do it here, but please turn again to the wonderful books and um, places that you can now go to following this. So thank you very much to the panelists and to the audience thank for you. joining in. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much.